continue on uh, part two of my talk. Um, okay, the title is a bit misleading for the first few slides, but um, just bear with me. So, uh, title here is Semi-Inner Products Part 2 or of Analysis, but I will not be talking about Semi-Inner Products for the first few slides, um, but this is okay. Um, I will need one of these um, definitions to be connected to Semi-Inner Products. Okay. So, um, we saw this yesterday or maybe in, um, in your linear algebra class. Um, in our product space X, it said uh, in inner product space X, a vector little x is said to be orthogonal to y. That's your notation. <laughs> if and only if there are inner products. This this this. Um, but for example, if you look at in in our product spaces, there are many equivalent statements to the statement that x is orthogonal to y. Right? For example, something like this. Diagram here. Uh, normal of x squared plus normal of y squared is equal to normal of x plus y squared. Now, if I were to generalize um, notion of orthogonality, if I look at this guy, right? Well, no inner products there. So what's stopping me from using this as a definition? Well, we can try, right? Um, so now erase everything, right? And now you're in normal space and you say, okay, my x is orthogonal to y if and only if. Um, but how good is this notion? Right. Uh, surely, once you move from um, inner product space to norm space, you lose certain things, right? Mm -hmm. So this cannot be as good as um, your usual orthogonality. But, but what do I mean by how good is this definition? Right? It's very vague, very vague statement. Um, you all have the handouts, so let's just follow it carefully. Um, so we don't have to. Vigor, do vigorous writing, right? Uh, okay, so there are some main properties of orthogonality that are listed in some literature, so uh, here they go. So one of them is non-degeneracy. So if you have lambda x times uh, mu x, this is true if and only if either one of them is here, right? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, a vector is orthogonal to itself or whatever scale multiple if it's zero. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, then you have all sorts of things like simplification. If x is orthogonal to y, I multiply both vectors with some lambda, then they're still orthogonal. Okay. Um, continuity. You have sequences of vectors orthogonal to each other. Um, well, uh, let me just say x is orthogonal to y then at, at this point. Um, and each of these sequences converge to something, x and y say, then uh, x is orthogonal to y. For sure this is true in inner product spaces. Homogeneity is a little bit stronger than simplification. I can multiply x with any scalar and multiply y with whatever scalar. It doesn't have to be the same, right? Okay, this is also true, yeah? Think of this. Doesn't matter how long, right? <laughs> okay. Um, symmetry. If x is orthogonal to y, then y is orthogonal to x. At least at this point, we know already an example that is not symmetric, right? From, from yesterday. If I use my semi inner product to define my orthogonality, already it's not good enough. I already use symmetry. Okay. What else, though? Additivity, right? If I have a vector orthogonal to something and orthogonal to something else, obviously it should be, right, in the inner product space, orthogonal to their addition. Um, existence. What does it mean? If I take any random two uh, vectors in X, I should be able to find some alpha such that X is orthogonal to alpha X plus 1. So the idea of this existence property is to ensure that whenever you create a definition for orthogonality, that there's at least one non-zero vector is orthogonal to a given vector. Because zero is orthogonal to everything. So once you create a definition of orthogonality, if the only vector that's orthogonal to it is zero, then it's not interesting, right? Yeah, so this is what existence is giving. The x and y must be linearly independent. Oh yeah, it must be linearly independent. Maybe let's add that. Okay. Good thing. 
thing about this is I can correct my slide. <laughs> Linearly independent x and y. Okay, there we go. Um, Linearly. Okay. And uniqueness of golf y is unique. <coughs> okay, excuse me. Okay. So I should say both alpha maybe with this. Yeah. This is this is um, probably more precise, yeah? It's nice with this pencil you can correct things on your slide. <laughs> Okay, so um, when people start introducing some orthogonality, you go check this list and see what properties you want from your orthogonality. Maybe you want symmetry, maybe you want additivity, so introduce something, check, see how good this definition. Okay? Um, okay so far? Yeah, okay, great. Now, um, back to my previous question. How does one define orthogonality, we already have, have one candidate, right? Um, so the strategy is find some equivalent statements to your um, to your x orthogonal to y, then use that as your definition. Okay. So this guy is inspired by the Pythagorean theorem, so we will put subscript p to distinguish it with other notions of orthogonality. Um, so that's one potential definition. Um, another potential definition, if you have orthogonal vectors, then the diagonal should be of the same length, right? I saw some of the Okay. The next one is called Birkhoff orthogonality. It looks like this. Uh, X is orthogonal to Y if and only if norm of X is less than or equal to norm of X plus lambda Y for all lambda in R. Okay, so I will focus on this one later because this one has a lot of um, some, some nice relationships with my semi-inner product orthogonality. Okay, so we will come back to, to B um, later. Now, this one is called Roberts orthogonality, uh, introduced by Roberts. I forgot the year, but anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, R for Roberts. Um, you see, this is kind of similar to the isosceles orthogonality, but a lot stronger, right? First, well, there's lambda, and this has to hold for all lambda. Okay, so there are those four things that um, that I will introduce to you today. There are a lot. There are also sort of ways of introducing orthogonality, but anyways, let's um, just get some taste, right, of, of what you can. Alright, homework again. <laughs> In any inner product space, show that these are actually equivalent statements. Yeah? Um, I will do that one together with you today. Um, but the, the other ones are not too complicated. Okay, so let's do this. Prove that in any inner product space, uh, bit of orthogonality coincides with the usual notion of orthogonality. Let me just make Go back to the previous slide so that you can see the definition of this per pop of organality. Okay. Hope it's not so long. Okay, so we want to show that x is orthogonal to b, uh, sorry, orthogonal to y in the b sense, if and only if um, x is orthogonal to y. In inner product space. Okay. Um, I think this implication is easier, so let me do it this way first. Okay. So, zoom. So, we start with the assumption that x is orthogonal to y, which means that the inner product of these two guys is zero. And then what? Well, I have to check what do I want to check? That this is greater than that. So, let's start from here. So, for any lambda in R, have um, x plus lambda y. I'm in inner product space, so if I look at the square, this I can expand my square, right? I have norm of x squared plus 2 lambda xy plus lambda squared y squared. Yes? But this is zero from assumption. Easy, right? You can see it already. You have this and something that is not negative. You have this. So the entire thing says this is greater than uh, normal x squared, k square root, done. Okay. 
Um, reverse incubation. That way. Okay, so now we assume that x is orthogonal to y in the Birkhoff sense, which means I have this for all lambda in R. Okay, we like the for all statement, right? Because we can choose lambda that will make our life easy. So choose. Of course, I've done the calculation already so that I know which lambda to choose. <laughs> okay, so choose lambda to be inner product of xy divided by normal flash. <coughs> okay, so if I have this, what happened? Uh, let's check. I have from something like this, right? I have normal x squared uh, plus two times that lambda, so this becomes negative, right? Um, normal, sorry, inner product of xy with that, I get squared, plus lambda squared, so I square this, I've got four of those, cancel with that, yeah? Um, this is greater than this. Let's simplify our inequality. What do we get? This guy cancel with that. And I have negative of xy divided by sorry squared. No negative, no negative, there's a negative sign. This is greater or equal to zero. What does this imply? Only happen when this guy is equal to zero. <laughs> okay. So what we just did is we show that in any in inner product space these two things are the same. Okay. So now after introducing your definitions for orthogonality, then you go and check carefully what properties do they satisfy. Okay. In most cases, um, orthogonality, well I say most cases because I only introduced four today, but there are many others, um, satisfy the following things, non-degeneracy, continuity, and simplification. In most cases. Now I created a little chart so that you can see carefully um, the properties and these orthogonality. Um, I didn't write I. They're usually the same as P, that's why I didn't write it. They're, they're quite similar, in fact they're from, from the same family. So just to make a quick note, this um, Pythagorean orthogonality and Asosus orthogonality, they came from the same family um, and the generalization of that family is called Carlson's orthogonality. You can Google this and, uh, that's not the correct spelling, orthogonality. So Carlson's orthogonality, you get lots of parameters there of alphas and betas attached to your x, y, and if you choose the correct parameters, you will get your uh, p or i, uh, depending on um, whatever that is. Okay. So let's see. Um, for example, you have this chart, so I'm not going to um, explain this too much. Right? For example, the fact that orthogonality in general is not homogeneous, if it is homogeneous, it has to be an inner product space. So once you have homogeneity of this guy, you are in inner product space. Okay. So in general, this is not true. Same goes with its additivity, right? Um, Etc. Oh, I used rotun here instead of cyclic. Uh, this means cyclic complex. Rotun. It's, it's a, some some people call it rotun, but this is actually um, I can use sc now because Professor Kato already <laughs> gave that abbreviation, so this is fine. Okay, um, this guy is very interesting, the Birkhoff orthogonality. Homogeneous, yes. Additivity, um, have to be careful here. I, did, I haven't shown you the next slide, yes, about symmetry. So whenever I talk about additivity, here I don't worry about it so much because this guy is symmetric. So I can just say additivity. But over here, you have to be careful. 
He has to say right additive or left additive. Yeah? So right additive, if and only if the space is smooth. Left, if and only if it's um, strictly convex. For two-dimensional spaces. For three-dimensional spaces and higher, inner product space. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> Existence, yes. Um, uniqueness, again to the right, if and only if smooth. To the left, if and only if strictly complex. A bit weird. Okay, but it's fine. Um, if you look at R, look at this column. Existence, if and only if inner product split. This guy is very problematic. Actually, it doesn't, it doesn't have the existence problem. So this is not a good definition, right? But a lot of people use it to characterize the inner product split. So what they often do is, if they can show that um, the orthogonality is equivalent to an R orthogonality, then you can say that, oh, that space has to be an inner product space. So there's a thick book called Characterization of Inner Product Spaces. And a lot of cases, they use um, R orthogonality. This is also one thing that um, a lot of researchers are doing. Um, how many, I don't know how many characterizations in that book, but it's a lot. So you can characterize a bar space to see, sorry, a norm space to see whether it's an inner product space or not. And one of them to use um, R orthogonality. So not very interesting this one, but it can be useful. Yeah? Not all failed experiments are bad. Yeah. Okay. So now if we look at symmetry for P and I and its higher family not. Uh, the constant orthogonality, but don't worry about it. So for P and I, yes. For R, yes, even though that's not interesting. For Birkhoff orthogonality, three-dimensional space and higher, that characterizes in the product space, but not the case for two-dimensional spaces. Um, so for two-dimensional spaces, for example, R2 with the following norm. I think this is called LP, LP space, yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, so if X, Y is non-negative, you impose an LP norm. If x, y is negative, then you use the LP norm. Okay? This is called the day space. Is that right? Uh, less than one. Okay, we come on Q, yes. Yeah. So we can uh, add maybe there. Um, where is it? Like, like this, yeah? P, Q. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so this is the day LP, LP space. What, what's the relation between P and Q? Uh, nothing. Nothing. I think it's nothing, yeah. The P and Q here, do they have to be whole or I don't think so. They can be anything in P and Q. Uh, no relation. Yeah. No relation. No relation. No relation. Yeah. No relation. No relation. yeah. No they can be anything. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So here, this guy is, well, if you use Birkhoff orthogonality definition in this space, it will be symmetric. Um, so it doesn't characterize in the product space. This is not an inner product. So, just a little side note, um, this, if, if you look at, especially for Birkhoff orthogonality, there's a distinction between two-dimensional space and then three-dimensional space and map. So there's this book that I mentioned earlier, let's say the book is this thick, characterization of um, three-dimensional and higher is this much, and the rest is two-dimensional space. In fact, it's more difficult to do things in two-dimensional space for these kind of things than um, three-dimensional and higher. Very strange. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. If you want the references, you can talk to me later and I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. Okay. Great. So, um, now back to Milicic, the G orth uh, orthogonality that I somewhat introduced already yesterday. Okay. So, um, Milicic actually introduced four kinds of orthogonality. I'll show you one yesterday. This one. Orthogonal to y if gxy is equal to zero. I warned you yesterday, be careful, don't say x and y are orthogonal because this is not symmetric. Say you want some symmetry. You can do something like this. You can say x is orthogonal to y now and y is orthogonal to x because of this criteria. So not only you require that gxy is equal to zero, you also require that dy x is equal to zero. If you like, maybe you can use this step. So I like how he just sort of put the G 
kind of around the orthogonality side. <laughs> See, now it's okay. <laughs> okay, so this guy, either one of them is dxy0 or dyx. Okay. The last one is a little bit strange. So here, x is orthogonal to y, g is here. G x plus lambda is 0, y, x is equal to normal x squared. So kind of similar to that purple orthogonality, right? In some sense. Like it, it looks a bit familiar. We kind of, maybe we saw it before, right? Okay. What is this lambda 0? It is actually the minimum of this x plus lambda y. Take the norm, take the minimum. That's the lambda 0 that gives you the minimum. Okay. So, uh, more homework. Prove that in any inner product space they all coincide. I will do the fourth one if you write it. Okay. The fourth one is very interesting. Um, where's the G? The G is here. There you go. Okay, let's show that this is in fact the um, usual orthogonality in inner product space. Okay. So if this guy happens, right? Then what? Well, let's check what happened to X. Um, remember G. If you're in inner product space, it's exactly the inner product, right? That's what we did yesterday before we introduced you. Okay, so we have x plus lambda zero y, inner product of x. Thank goodness I'm in inner product space. Don't worry about linearity, in which argument, blah, 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 right? So I have this. Yes? Um, that is zero. And I'm done, right? That's what I want to show. Yeah. That this guy is equal to normal x squared. E. Okay. For simplification, maybe let's look at this space. <laughs> okay. So this way, um, so suppose that x is orthogonal to y in the sense of that g. So does that mean? That means this whole thing um, on the board, oh, sorry, on the slide, which I'm not going to write on the board. <laughs> something, right? Um, and then what? Let's have a look at this guy again. x plus lambda 0 y comma x is equal to xx. This is given, right? But this guy is what? xx plus, because we're in inner product space, right? So lambda 0 times yx is equal to zero. Yeah. So if lambda zero is not zero, easy, right? Done. If lambda zero is zero, then what happened? And let's have a look at that statement again. Minimum of x plus lambda y over all lambda is exactly normal x plus lambda zero y. Lambda zero is zero. So I have this. But what does this mean? This means for all lambda in R, x plus lambda y is greater than its minimum. Who is this? This guy, which we know in plus is well equivalent. We only need the one implication, right? Done. Okay, so we have kind of a way. Yeah. Okay, so four definitions from Milicic. But as he continued on with his work, these three guys are quite cumbersome actually to work with. Like lots of yeah, lots of requirements, right? So he tend to focus on the first one. And we're going to do the same. Okay. That I proved already. So the first one easy, and we can remember its definition, very simple x orthogonal to y if g of x, y is equal to 0. And we will refer to this as g orthogonality. Okay. Um, again, exercise, not difficult. Show that g orthogonality is homogeneous, non-degenerate, existing, and right continuous. If you can find my undergraduate thesis somewhere in the library, <laughs> then you will find the answer to that this exercise. <laughs> Okay, and we know this, yeah? G orthogonality is not symmetric, obvious from its definition. Um, but what about additivity? And be careful, because we're saying not, symmet not symmetric, 
when you say additivity, you think three calls mass and rock. This is hard, right? Because if you look at how what we say x is orthogonal to y and x is orthogonal to z, this pen is not good. Uh, implies x is orthogonal to y plus z. We're coming from the right. But this, if you want in g, meaning you want this guy, right? If you want it from the left, it's, it's, it's quite different, right? Because we don't even know what happened with, with the first argument. So let's leave that for now. Do we have this? Do we have um, additivity for our g? Remember, the only thing we know yesterday, if the space is not given any condition, is this, right? I can expand this kind of thing. But if I have y plus z, there's a requirement yesterday. What was the requirement? Smoothness, right? OK. So if the space is smooth, then um, I can change this to y plus z and then sort of split them, right? Um, I think I still have time, which yesterday I didn't prove, but I want to prove this now. Um, because I think the, 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 the proof is quite interesting. So x is smooth implies that g, I just say g, x, y is linear in x. Sorry, linear in both. Linear in the second part, yeah? Okay. So let's prove this. Well, I didn't do this yesterday, but I think the proof is quite interesting. So let's, um, let's have a look at this proof. And if we can prove this, then um, every time we have linearity, then we have the, if, if this is yes, then this is yes, right? For uh, right hand um, OK, so proof. Uh, we have that. Um, you can check this yourself. The tangent functional, 2xy uh, is equal to this. I'm not going to prove it. Um, you can play around with the limit. Remember what is this tau? It is limit as t goes to 0, either from the left or from the right, x plus t y minus norm of x divided by t. I'll leave it on the board just in case uh, we forget. And remember, g of x y is really just norm of x, half of each of them. There's x y in the argument, but I'm just slightly lazy. Okay. So uh, I'll show this first. In fact, you can do this for any alpha. Uh, doesn't matter. And why do I want this? Because instead of writing x, I want to write 2x in the following form. x, y1 plus y2. I will write it as 2x, y1 plus y2. Sorry, plus minus. It will be equal because we have smooth this, but anyways, doesn't matter. And this is equal to what? I want the following limit t goes to 0 plus minus 2x plus y1 plus y2 minus x, which is 2x, divided by t. There's a t here, sorry. Yeah. Oh, there you go. OK. And now I can split them into x plus t1 y1 and x plus t1 y2, right? That's the idea. And I'm going to apply triangle inequality here, but I have to be careful, right? Uh, is my t positive or negative? Um, because I'm dividing by t, right? So I have to be careful here. So I'm going to just sort of skip that part and then apply triangle inequality. You now the minus x, minus x, because the two can come out, right? So there's two of those. And then rather than looking at that, I'm going to write it like this. Divide by t. Divide by t. Sorry, this is ty2. It's also just t. Um, limit as t goes to 0 from the left and from the right. 
depending whether t is positive or negative, sometimes you have this, sometimes you have this, right? So, <coughs> leave it for now. Okay. In just a moment, it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is what? This is equal to tau plus minus x uh, y1, right? Uh, plus t plus minus x y2. Okay, we're almost there. So what do we have? We have that if we have plus, it is less than or equal to, yeah, if we have minus, whoop, too many brackets, this is like this, but what does smoothness mean? That this plus and minus are the same thing. Equal, 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 forcing the whole thing to be equal because these two guys are equal, right? So, in fact, right? You multiply with normal x, then you get g, g, and g.
g x x plus lambda one. Remember, I don't impose any condition on my g on my x. Sorry, may not be linear, so I want this kind of form, yeah, so that I can use still on board. Let go right there. Okay, so what is this? This is g of x x is non square, right? Plus uh, lambda g of x y, right? Which is zero. So this is just normal x squared, which is non-negative. Okay, so we know that this whole thing is non-negative. So this is g of x, x plus lambda y, Cauchy short. Yeah? I don't need absolute value, you know that that's one negative. And then now what do we have? We have this, it's less than or equal to this, but our x is not zero. I can cancel that and I'm done. goes to zero. 
zero from the right, this whole thing becomes tau minus xy less than or equal to zero, less than or equal to tau plus xy. Okay? But the space is smooth. This guy and this guy equal. Combine it with this, everything is zero. Right? So g of xy is also zero. One, two, plus smoothness. One plus two plus three. Somewhere there, g xy is equal to zero. So x is orthogonal to y in the g sets. Yeah? Okay. So this becomes if and only if in smooth space. Quite interesting. Okay. So please remember these two guys for tomorrow because I will need them for my reach representation theorem. Um, so I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Okay. So if you, it's quite impossible to remember everything, at least remember these two guys. Yeah? Berkhoff and this, this is the easy one, right? Okay. So please remember this for tomorrow. Okay, um, how much time do I have? About six minutes, yeah? Okay, I'm just going to show you very quickly, no proving, because I won't have time. Um, why do we bother with the G function? Instead of these other orthogonalities, right? Um, do I still have space on the board somewhere? Okay. Let's just use this, this bit, so doesn't matter. Um, when, when you learn orthogonality in linear algebra, once you learn orthogonality, um, what is the next step that you do? Well, there's all sorts of things being introduced, and one of them is Ramsey projection, right? With Ramsey projection, you need that um, form of the inner part, right? So if you use any kind of other orthogonality, it's kind of strange, right? Because it's, there's not, not, nothing similar to an inner product. But if you use this G, if you use this um, G functional, then assuming you can replace your um, inner product with this G, then you will have exactly um, something maybe, if you just change the formula in your Ramsey projection, what would you get, right? But obviously, okay, what's the good thing about a uh, Ramsey process? You start with a linearly independent set, then you can make it an orthonormal um, set, right? So if you start with a basis, then you can find an orthonormal basis, which we like, because you know the coefficients, right? Um, any vector can be expressed as a linear combination of its basis, and if you know this orthonormal basis, then this is nice. You know exactly what the coefficients are, right? That's, what, that's why we like Ramsey projection. Okay, so here, you can do the same thing for Gramsci projection. Um, I'm going to skip the definition real quick. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Um, G is not symmetric, right? We you know this. So when you do the Gramsci process, you just replace the inner product with G. Instead of getting an orthonormal set, you will get a left orthonormal set. So it's orthonormal if you do it that way, but if you change the index or if you sort of swap them around, it won't work anymore. Okay, so it's really um, depending on the first vector that you start, and then the next one, and then the next one, etc., etc., etc. So orthonormal means what? Sorry, left orthonormal means what? It's zero if i is less than j, ij is one if they're equal. Right? So slightly different with our usual orthonormal, where here it only requires to be non equal, right? Okay, so the graph smith projection, in fact, um, Look similar, right? The projection was similar to your um, your orthonormal, sorry, uh, Ramsey projection in in a cross space. Only here is gyx <coughs> instead of uh, gxy because we're projecting onto y. And remember yesterday when I defined my semi-inner product, I have to flip, right? Yeah. So it's gyx divided by normal of y squared uh, times y. So you do this process. And you will get, um, where is it? Yeah, there it is. So you start like in uh, linear algebra, 
uh, e1 is x1, if you start, yeah, you can just divide by its norm, right? So you start with unit vectors anyway. In a literally independent finite set of unit vectors, e1 is x1, and then it is x1 minus the projection divided by, just to get uh, normal, you, uh, sorry, norm, uh, normalize your unit vector, right? So that you get unit vector. Okay. And you do this process the entire time, and then you will get a left orthonormal set. Okay. Um, I'm almost out of time. It's all in the notes. This is just to show you the flavor of what you can do with these things. Um, and I tease you about that alpha, right? The coefficients, right? Mm -hmm. If you have an inner product space, it's quite nice. It's just inner product of um, your unit vector with x, right? Here's a bit real. x, alpha 1, e1, etc., etc. These alphas will be g, e1, x for the first one, and the rest is a bit fun. It's g, e, n, x minus the linear combination of the, of the previous ones in this sense. Yeah? It's because we have left orthonormal set instead of orthonormal set. So a little bit uglier, but at least it has some kind. Okay. So it looks a bit different, yeah? With the obvious, because of uh, we lost um, symmetry, right? Okay, so it's all in the handouts. You can read it carefully if you want, um, and ask me questions now or later, doesn't matter, and I will, I will stop here. Okay, thank you very much.